All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Nicole Byram. I'm a registered dietitian with the Canadian Celiac Association. And tonight you are registered to come and hear our wonderful guest speakers, who I will introduce in just a minute, um, speak about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and celiac disease. Of course, the goal and the mission for the CCA is that every Canadian with celiac disease be diagnosed and empowered. The Celiac Association has been empowering Canadians with celiac disease and gluten, gluten disorders to live their best life for nearly 50 years. We are a trusted resource and a national advocate. If any of you are not part of our CCA Facebook group, I highly suggest that you join and um, and be part of this very, very vibrant community. Um, here you can ask questions and have conversations. It's 16,000 plus, I think it actually might be over 17,000 now um, and growing strong. Of course, if you're a member of the CCA um, and have signed up to receive our magazines and our newsletters, our magazine comes out three times a year and a newsletter is de delivered to your inbox every month. Remembering, of course, that the CCA is a registered charity and we rely on everyone's donations to put on these free events and provide all the free information and resources um, in order to help each family and help empower everybody living with celiac disease or supporting someone with celiac disease. If you're here at this webinar, then I assume that you like to hear about, um, you like to, to watch webinars and to hear about new, new information. So, Every month we host the Gluten-Free 101 and here we talk about everything you need to know when newly diagnosed or needing a refresher. Our next Gluten-Free 101 is being hosted on Sunday, September 25th at 4 p.m. Eastern. You can sign up for that under www.celiac.ca slash events. And of course, our national conference, which, is, which we help hold once a year, is coming up on November 12th and the 13th. Sign up is free. And I really suggest you don't miss this very exciting weekend. Okay, so some housekeeping. How does this um, webinar work? Everybody will be on mute in case there's background noise, dogs barking, kids playing, dinner being made. We don't necessarily need to hear it. So we're, everybody will be on mute. If you have questions for our presenters, please type them in the Q&A box. This session is being recorded and a copy of the webinar will be put um, will be mailed out, emailed to you in the next few days. And so without further ado, I would like to introduce our amazing presenters. Um, first up, uh, Dr. Amelie Therrien, who is who studied at um, Montreal University and is now an adult gastroenterologist at the Celiac Center at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and is an instructor of medicine at the Harvard Medical School. Dr. Terrian devotes 50% of her time to research and recently received a Junior Faculty Development Award from the American College of Gastroenterology to develop a research program in celiac disease. Her work includes that on mast cells and celiac disease, celiac disease in the postpartum period, and clinical trials such as latagglutinase um, solutions for celiac study. I would also like to welcome Dr. Repetto, um, who is a family doctor in Alma, north of Quebec. I, uh, Dr. Repetto practices as a hospitalist and is a comprehensive family doctor and a member of the Canadian National, the Canadian Celiac Association's professional, professional advisory committee. As somebody living with celiac disease herself, she is also a volunteer for the Canadian Celiac Association as well, and an occasional collaborator with Celiac Quebec. So thank you so much to both of you for joining us today. I will stop sharing my screen and I will hand it over to you, to, to you both, or Dr. Therian. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm just gonna, so are you, are you able to see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. So, I'm not sure. Yeah. Yes. Just, just Nicole, someone was saying the Q&A is not uh, enabled, just in case someone wants to ask questions with Dr. Terry and through the Q&A. So, yeah, so the Q&A is enabled, the chat is disabled. Um, so okay. if everybody on the very bottom panel, you'll see Q&A and that's where we want to collect all the questions because that's where they're, they're actually housed. We lose everything that's in the chat once the Zoom is over, but the questions that are collected in the Q&A are actually uh, recorded. So if you could please put everything in that Q&A, that would be wonderful. Okay, 
Sounds good. So, so yeah, so the topic of the, the evening um, or late afternoon for people on the West Coast is uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and celiac disease. Is there a connection? Um, let me see. I just need to familiarize. Okay, perfect. So I don't have any uh, conflict of interest related to this talk. So the objectives of the presentation will be to understand what is celiac disease, what is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, or let's just say fatty liver disease, uh, what cause fatty liver, um, is there a link between celiac disease and fatty liver, why are people in our community concerned about fatty liver, and what can we do to prevent or treat fatty liver disease. Um, as the audience knows, uh, celiac disease is an immune disorder where the immune system attacks the small intestine when exposed to gluten. It can present with intestinal and extraintestinal manifestation, but some people are also asymptomatic. Uh, there are in most people antibodies to either tissue transglutaminase or deamidated gliadin peptide at the time of the diagnosis, and they slowly decrease over time uh, while being on a gluten-free diet. In adults, the diagnosis of celiac disease should combine positive blood work, the TTG, and biopsies that show inflammation and villous atrophy. Um, so on the left, uh, the lower left, uh, you have a picture of an endoscopy, which show uh, some scalloping fold and what we see usually when someone has um, severe celiac disease when we do an endoscopy. And on the lower right, uh, you have the continuum of the biopsy findings. So a normal intestine has nice like finger-like villi. And um, with worsening of the damages, you develop eventually complete flat uh, villi, complete villus atrophy, which is kind of like a shaving of the, of the intestines. So celiac disease affects nearly one in 114 Canadians, and about 90% of celiac disease cases remain undiagnosed. Um, it is one of the most common food-related lifelong disorder worldwide. Although we do not have good epidemiological data for every country of the world, we suspect that celiac disease is present everywhere with higher trends depending on the prevalence of HLA and the lifestyles. Uh, so why are some people developing celiac disease and why am I talking about lifestyle? Uh, first, you need to have a genetic predisposition, either HLA DQ2 or DQ8. The HLA are like little antennas on, on the immune, um, immune cells that catch the gluten. But in addition to these HLA, there are more than 57 genes that have been associated to the disease. These genes are related, for instance, to intestinal permeability, activation of the immune system. The microbiota, so the type of bacteria that lives in you, also has a big role in the immune tolerance, but also pre-processing the gluten. We have lots of information on this, thanks to the team at McMaster University in Ontario. Uh, there are bacteria that could further digest the gluten, reduce its immunogenicity, and others are making it even more toxic, increase intestinal permeability, activate the immune system. So all the events in life, like after the microbiota, may increase the risk of developing celiac disease. Virus infection may also have a role triggering the immune system to be pro-inflammatory, increasing intestinal permeability. Ability. And finally, our Western diet, uh, the, the highly processed food, can also have an impact. We know that some artificial substance emulsifiers, such as polysorbate 80 and whipped cream, for instance, increase intestinal permeability and cause colitis in mice. So there is more genetic involvement than only the HLA, and the environment may play a major role in the development of celiac disease. And all of these factors, uh, I was I kept mentioning intestinal permeability. So what is this concept? So uh, the intestinal cells are uh, attached to each other by little Velcros that are called uh, the tight junctions. And it forms a barrier preventing some of the bacteria, toxin, chemical to be absorbed and circulate in our body. So all the bacteria and chemicals stays inside of the intestine. However, there are multiple factors and diseases that can increase, uh, that, I'm sorry, that can loosen the Velcros and increase intestinal permeability. And in celiac disease, this is the way some of the gluten peptides can be absorbed and meet the immune system in the mucosa. And like we just said previously, we believe that genes, bacteria, viral infection, and diet can all increase intestinal permeability and make someone slowly progress towards celiac disease when they are genetically predisposed. 
another concept I would like to uh, explain is that in some people, like the atrophy is very severe. There is lots of malabsorption, weight loss. So on the left, you have uh, a complete, like complete villus atrophy. It's totally flat in the intestine. While on the right, you have a normal intestine uh, with all the villi causing a, a nice little like shaggy rug. Um, so, so yeah, so some people with celiac disease present with like diarrhea, weight loss, malabsorption in the blood work. However, we also find a high number of people who are in fact overweight or obese at the time of their diagnosis. Um, so in these studies um, that occur like in, last, in the last 10, 20 years, uh, up to 30% of people were overweight at the time of their diagnosis, and 13% were even obese. And this may also occur in children. So it is counterintuitive and surprising to think that, oh, something that caused like villus atrophy, inflammation, uh, can, can also occur with someone that is in fact overweight. But there are a few mechanisms that can explain that. Some people may be overeating uh, to compensate. Having high blood sugar or high fat in the diet uh, can stimulate the villi in the intestine to in fact be taller. And there are uh, some hormones, the GLP-2, for instance, that are released when someone has malabsorption absorption, and it makes the villi grow to try to compensate. And uh, people with obesity have higher levels of GLP-2, and with the malabsorption, it's just like further increase. So to summarize this first part of the, the talk on celiac disease, the disease is frequent and underdiagnosed in Canada. It is associated with intestinal permeability and a change in the microbiota. And many people are overweight or obese at the time of the diagnosis of celiac disease. Moving on to non alcoholic fatty liver disease. So uh, fatty liver disease is the accumulation of fat in the liver, like on when we do our liver biopsies, we see that the cells get filled with a uh, little uh, white vesicle that are in fact full of fat. So these are examples of biopsies of a fatty liver on the right and biopsies of a normal liver on the left. Um, it is called non-alcoholic because regular alcohol use can also cause fatty infiltration in the liver. However, when someone has fatty liver and drinks less than 14 drinks per week as women and 21 drinks per week as men regularly over two years, it's unlikely to be only caused by alcohol. Um, it is a global epidemic and Canada is among the countries with a high prevalence between 20 and 30 percent of the population in general in Canada um, has fatty liver disease. This figure also showed the repartition of a polymorphism of the gene PNPLA3, which predisposed to non alcoholic fatty liver disease. And as you can see, it is frequent in Latin American and Asian compared to the Caucasian population. And PNPLA3 is a protein that contributes to transform the fat stored in the liver into small vesicle, the VLDL, that are sent to other cells. So when there is a mutation on the genes and the protein is not working well, the fat keeps accumulating in the liver. So the disease has a continuum. It starts with uh, steatosis or fatty liver, which is having the little fatty vesicle inside. Uh, then you can develop inflammation and progressively some stiffness, scarring of the liver. I like to say that this liver is like a, a big sponge with blood flowing across it. And when you have inflammation and scarring, the sponge is becoming harder. And when the sponge is rock hard, this is cirrhosis. So cirrhosis is usually irreversible and is a risk factor for having liver cancer. Fatty liver and NASH, non alcoholic uh, steatosis, so having inflammation in the liver, are reversible, and the risk to progress from fatty liver to NASH range from 12 to 40 percent over time, and the uh, progression from NASH to cirrhosis 15 to 25 percent over time. So it's not everybody who progress into a cirrhosis. And how do we diagnose fatty liver disease? So first, uh, fatty liver is seen on an ultrasound, which is a non-invasive test. When there is no elevation of the liver enzymes, it is usually isolated fatty liver disease or steatosis. Uh, 
Uh, we also have to determine whether this is more an alcoholic liver disease with questioning the person about their alcohol intake. Uh, we also look for other causes of fatty liver because medication, infection, malnutrition, Wilson can also cause fatty liver. And when there are elevated uh, liver enzymes in the blood, signs of chronic liver disease, we also dig further for autoimmune uh, condition, hepatitis, hemochromatosis. So overall, uh, we need to do some blood work to make sure that there's nothing else like going on than uh, the fat accumulating in the liver because of the metabolism and other factors I'm going to talk about. So um, I spoke about like fatty liver disease, NASH, the, the type that has like the inflammation and the becoming of the fibrosis is usually present with elevated liver enzyme in the blood. It's also important to check for fibrosis. So usually this type of fatty liver disease uh, requires to have a fibro scan, which is a special ultrasound to look at whether or not the liver is like becoming more stiff towards cirrhosis or is the liver still like a nice soft sponge. Uh, we sometimes do a liver biopsy when we want to exclude another process or if we need to confirm the inflammation before starting a medication, but a liver biopsy is not necessarily commonly performed for uh, fatty liver disease. And what are the risk factors for having a progressing liver disease? Uh, first, as I mentioned, some people have a genetic predisposition, and in, in, in this genetic predisposition is a bit more frequent among like Latin American, Asians. Uh, diet is also a big factor, especially fructose, which is transformed into fat uh, in the liver. And I'll develop that more uh, later during the talk. And as for celiac disease, there is increased intestinal permeability with fatty liver disease and dysbiosis, like changes in the type of bacteria in the intestine, which can contribute to toxin going from the intestine to the liver and causing um, inflammation. So just to explain this biosis, we know that the healthy liver and a healthy intestinal mucosa and metabolism are associated with certain types of bacteria in the upper uh, left. And over time, depending on your diet and other uh, inflammatory process, the intake of antibiotics, uh, the type of bacteria can change and be associated with more inflammation, insulin resistance, and having a profile that, yes, is more like pro-inflammatory rather than just a normal uh, flora. And you may wonder why I'm not like right away talking about diabetes, cholesterol, high blood pressure. So yes, obesity plays a role in fatty liver disease, but we are finding more and more people who are lean, in fact, who have a normal BMI, but still have fatty liver disease. In the US, about 20 to 25% of people with fatty liver are not obese. And this is a condition called metabolic associated fatty liver disease and uh, genetic may really play an increased role uh, driving uh, the development of that accumulation of fat in the liver. So to summarize the pathogenesis of fatty liver, uh, you have a trigger, which can be like Western diet with lots of processed food that can change the type of bacteria in your intestine, which leads to inflammation, increasing the senol permeability. This causes uh, leakages of the bacterial component into the circulation and it goes to the liver and it triggers an immune response in the liver, inflammation, eventually insulin resistance and impaired uh, lipid metabolism. Uh, especially if you are genetically predisposed. So to finish the second part on fatty liver, uh, fatty liver is frequent in our population, 20 to 30 percent of Canadians. About 25 percent of people uh, with fatty liver are not overweight. Uh, risk factors include genetics and diet, and uh, increased intestinal permeability and microbiota can contribute to the development of fatty liver. So moving on to the links between celiac disease and fatty liver. So there are different etiologies of fatty liver in uh, celiac disease. So especially at the time of diagnosis. So when people have malnutrition, uh, they, they their metabolism is different and fat accumulates in the liver. There is also a form of inflammation called celiac hepatitis, and these are reversible on a gluten-free diet. But as uh, some of our patients are also obese at the time of the diagnosis, they may have already like the pre-existing non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And uh, that may not 
go back to normal with a gluten-free diet. And I'll expand more on that later. Uh, so we can reassess over the first year following the diagnosis, whether the fatty liver, the steatosis is improving, whether the liver enzymes also are, are improving. Because usually when it's someone, what it, when it is something that is uh, caused by celiac disease, caused by the malnutrition, it should improve over time on a gluten-free diet. So the two diseases can increase each other's risk by similar pathogenesis. So for instance, when you have celiac disease, you have changes in your, in your bacteria, you have intestinal inflammation, you have increased intestinal permeability that contributes to the leakage of bacteria, products, a toxin in the liver, and that can cause an immune response in the liver, inflammation. And this is one of the reasons why we have like sometimes abnormal blood work at the time of diagnosis with celiac disease. But if you are also genetically predisposed to have like non ikate fatty liver disease, you may develop insulin resistance, impaired lipid metabolism, and uh, fatty liver. And on the other end, if you have fatty liver, you're, you're obese, you, you have developed over time some, some fat in your liver, but you also have the HLA that predispose you to uh, celiac disease. Um, you may uh, eventually develop like more and more intestinal permeability, which makes the gluten you eat being more absorbed inside of your intestine and more in contact with your immune system. And depending on other factors, you can eventually develop an autoimmune uh, response and develop celiac disease. So the idea of having like uh, fatty liver disease and uh, that becoming a risk factor for eventually developing celiac disease is supported by this population study from Germany, where adults aged uh, 18 years old to 50 years old with fatty liver disease had 2.79 more risk of eventually developing celiac disease over time than adults without uh, non alcoholic fatty liver disease. This association was mostly with men, which is interesting, knowing that we usually diagnose more celiac disease in women than in men. And to continue with this thought, on the left, you have three studies showing rates, high rates of celiac disease among people that were already diagnosed with fatty liver disease. As you can see, uh, the, these rates were between 2 and 7%, which is way higher than the global prevalence of celiac disease that is around like 1%. And also in the first study by uh, Kamal, uh, patient with celiac disease and non alcoholic fatty liver disease had a, high, a significantly lower BMI. So they were more lean and still having uh, fatty liver disease. And on the right part of the slides, you have studies showing the incidence of non alcoholic fatty liver disease among celiac disease patients with rates in the 30%. And the last study mentioning a 13%, uh, I'm sorry, a 13 higher risk of diagnosis, uh, diagnosing uh, non alcoholic fatty liver disease in the first year after the diagnosis compared to people without celiac disease, likely means that the disease was already present at the time of the diagnosis, but not um, diagnosed. So in general, factors associated with non alcoholic fatty liver disease among people with celiac disease still include having a high BMI, so having like a ratio between your uh, weight and your height that is higher than 25, a uh, high cholesterol and elevated like ALT. ALT is a liver enzyme that is present in the blood. So uh, non alcoholic fatty liver disease is also more present in select disease patients with normal BMI. Uh, than non celiac disease patient. This is a case control study from Italy showing that people with celiac disease had a higher incidence of fatty liver, 35%, compared to 21% of the control. And 20% uh, of the people with celiac disease who had a normal BMI also had fatty liver disease compared to only 5% of the control without uh, celiac disease. So now let's talk specifically about the effect of the gluten-free diet. So we see in clinic and have multiple studies confirming that people are gaining weight on the gluten-free diet. In the left side, it is an in study showing an increase of the number of people that are overweight or obese after two years on a gluten-free diet. On the right side is our cohort from Boston showing the same at the time of the diagnosis, 32% of patients were either obese or overweight already in Boston. And after three years on a gluten-free diet, that, that increased to 39%. And 
There is also more people developing metabolic syndrome, which is a combination of having high blood pressure, high waist circumference, and hyperglycemia, high cholesterol. If you look at the left side, almost all of these parameters worsen on a gluten-free diet. Excuse me. <laughs> and the rate of metabolic syndrome went from 2% at diagnosis on the right to 29% um, after one year on a gluten-free diet. So all these parameters, like the weight, um, the cholesterol, uh, the, the blood sugar, the, it, it all progressed on uh, the gluten-free diet. The development of fatty liver disease is also concerning here in this Italian cohort at the time of the diagnosis. Already 29% of people had um, fatty liver, but this rate grew to 47% after two years on the gluten-free diet. And the rate of uh, metabolic associated fatty liver disease grew more than non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So the dark blue circle means people that were ne not necessarily overweight, but were still having some fatty liver. The degree of fat infiltration also worsens after one year on a gluten-free diet uh, with 18% having severe uh, steatosis one year after the diagnosis compared to only 2% at the time of the diagnosis. And there is also evidence that fibrosis progresses quicker in the group with celiac disease and fatty liver compared to the group without um, celiac disease. So the fat accumulates like uh, quicker in the, the liver and the inflammation, the scarring progress at a quicker rate uh, when you have both disease compared to having only fatty liver disease without having celiac disease. So why are people with celiac disease on a gluten-free diet gaining weight and developing fatty liver disease? So first, as we learned earlier, the two diseases share similar mechanism and it can take some time for the inflammation from celiac disease and the intestinal permeability to improve even on a gluten-free diet. Second, uh, with celiac disease being treated, with being on a gluten-free diet, having uh, villi that are growing back, the absorption improves, and it leads to having more calories, nutrients being available for the metabolism. And if the body has been depleted for some time, the pattern is to store as much as possible what is ingested. Uh, the processed baked goods made gluten-free are unfortunately more fat and sweet to make it more palatable in the absence of gluten, because we know that gluten makes the flour, the dough being very elastic, and then the gluten-free cereals are, are, are less tasty and not, not elastic at all. So there's lots of added uh, stuff to the, to the products. And finally, uh, there are some disordered eating mechanism that can occur among people with celiac disease. So like I was just talking about, uh, there are many studies that have studied the composition of the gluten-free diet compared to the non-gluten-free equivalent. Uh, this one is from the UK, and it basically showed that all the gluten-free products, except for crackers, were richer either in sugar or fat than the regular items. And again, it's mostly to try to make the product more fluffy, more palatable, because the cereals that are gluten-free does not have those nice proteins of gluten that makes everything like more like elastic and uh, and so so it's it's harder to cook with those uh, those flours as you as the audience know well. And finally, uh, there are all sorts of eating disorders that can occur in celiac disease. Uh, the most reported are restrictive eating or avoidant restrictive food intake. But overcompensation and binges are probably underreported. And um, I, I don't think that people are necessarily like openly disclosing that to their, uh, their doctors, their gastroenterologists. So examples of disordered eating includes to be upset about the limitation of the diet and overcompensating with wine, chocolate, cookies, cakes. Uh, something that people without celiac disease do not always understand is the concern that some food stuff we like will not be available anymore because the ingredients changes or there is a discontinuation of the line, which leads to hoarding and overeating the products while it lasts. 
Um, there is also the example of having to travel a lot to get a special food item that may be perishable, like gluten-free pastries, or to be on a trip and finding a gluten-free item that we don't have the chance to eat a lot usually, for instance, pizza, and eating multiple regular portions of the item in a short period of time ourselves, because it, it is our only time. And another example is to eat before a social event in case gluten-free food will not be available, but then realizing that, oh, there's gluten-free food there. And thus we eat twice, not to be rude or because we want to enjoy the food. So these behaviors can lead to higher calories intake over time that are mostly for carbs and fat, and that can contribute to, to weight gain. So um, the last part of the talk is about how to prevent and treat non lactate fatty liver disease. Um, I hate to bring additional diet recommendations to this audience, uh, but to preconize a Mediterranean or a DASH diet instead of the Western diet is the mainstay for non lactic fatty liver disease prevention and treatment, and it is mostly overall gluten-free. Um, one important step is also to cut off all added sugar, especially sweet drinks. So, um, so I know at first it can be counterintuitive, but um, these sugars like fructose um, are in fact directly changed in the liver into fat and are not used by uh, the pancreas and the muscles like glucose for your regular energy and uh, your regular metabolism. And uh, sucrose is a sugar that combines glucose and fructose. And um, all of these sugars listed in the slides are relatively high in some of the some of the bad sugars and uh, some of them are in general not even gluten-free uh, so a big step is uh, to limit all the juice or the liquid calories candy sweet desserts once you have fatty liver um, the goal is to lose a certain percentage of weight especially around the waist uh, this can be done through change in the type of diet the type of food the portions increasing in physical activity to burn more calories. Uh, I mentioned before the Mediterranean and the DASH diets. Intermittent fasting also showed some improvement on the fatty liver, but usually the studies are only over the course of like three months. So we do not know well the effect long-term, but it can still be a possibility. And in addition to the diet and exercising, uh, stress reduction, tobacco avoidance, and sleep, are, an important, are important lifestyle changes. And the good news is that with weight loss, fatty infiltration and fibrosis can improve. For instance, with more than 5% weight loss, 65% of people had reduction in the amount of fat in the liver. And this goes to 100% when there is a weight loss that is over 10%. I just want to say it's not like a disappearance of all the fat, but everybody will lose some fat in the liver if they lose more than 10% of their body weight, assuming that they are at first overweight. So in terms of medication, there are no drugs that are approved specifically to treat fatty liver disease. Uh, the main reason to treat are either when someone has diabetes or obesity on top of the fatty liver. Um, there are GLP-1 analogs such as Victoza, Ozempic, Wegovi, that are used in these settings and can be helpful for the liver. Uh, these medications slow down the gastric emptying, so people are feeling full more rapidly, and they also increase the sensitivity to um, insulin. And um, I put vitamin E. There are some data that show that vitamin E could be helpful in, in NASH when you have like elevated like liver enzyme, when you have inflammation in the liver, but uh, it can also be harmful in some people. So even though it is an over-the-counter uh, supplement, I encourage you to follow doctor's instruction and not start by yourself vitamin E supplements. And finally, um, Bariatric surgery is an option in general for severe morbid obesity, and it has it has a good effect on fatty liver. And uh, we over the years we are seeing people with celiac disease also undergoing bariatric surgery because of metabolic syndromes, uh, severe obesity, and um, being unable to lose weight with uh, lifestyles modifications. So uh, to conclude, celiac disease and non-lactic fatty liver disease are frequent in North America. 
The two diseases may be linked and predisposed to each other. Uh, people with celiac disease are at higher risk of developing non alkylic fatty liver disease after their diagnosis. Um, diet and lifestyle modifications remain the first treatment for fatty liver disease. And so thank you very much for inviting me. I would like to mention that there is an international symposium next week in Italy uh, where uh, it will only be on celiac disease and we will likely hear from a lot of exciting research. Thank you, Dr. Terian. I must say that they put me among the panelists, but it was all her the presentation. I was only a bit coordinating the, that this took place.